That's right. Free your mind and the rest will follow. Good morning and welcome to the Free Your Mind Project's radio show. I'm Brian with my guest host, Wendy. Good morning, Brian. Good morning. Uh, Free Your Mind Projects are all about breaking stigma and uh, talking about uh, mental health issues and everything from daily stressors to things that are more severe like bipolar, schizophrenia, everything in between. We're here to send out some positive messages and talk about um, healthy things that you can do to live life healthy. Uh, May is Mental Health Awareness Month, which we've talked about over the past couple of uh, episodes of the show. But it is also Foster Care Awareness Month. And um, it's I think this is going to be a really cool show because uh, our guests are going to be talking about I think a lot of things about foster care that, you know, we talk about breaking stigma on the show and people have certain attitudes towards foster care and the people that are involved with foster care. And uh, uh, I I think on today's show, we might be able to dispel some of those myths and and educate people. Definitely. And um, I was reading the bios of our uh, two kids that are here and they are just really they've gone through a lot and but they've managed to just really do well with their lives. And we're going to talk about how they went through all that in the support systems that were there and available to them. So I'm very happy about this one. So keep it here on Fear Mind Projects, the radio show. Also keep in mind that we are not doctors. We're not physicians. We don't dispense any pharmaceuticals or give any advice. Um, all we're here to do are present experts and present some really cool people that you guys can listen to. Uh, you can take in the facts. You can take in the information. And then you can act on it. Uh, we are on the air and online at FreeYourMindProjects.com. That's with an S, FreeYourMindProjects.com. And so stay with us. Coming up, we're going to talk about foster care. We're going to talk about mental health. We're going to meet some really cool people uh, right here on AM830, Free Your Mind Projects, the radio show. Free Your Mind. Are you in charge of hiring at your company? Now is a great time to hire LA's youth. Hire LA's youth has thousands of qualified pre-screened entry-level job candidates who have successfully completed the rigorous work readiness certification program from the City of Los Angeles and the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce. So you know you're getting a qualified candidate who uses Hire LA's youth, well, Vons for one. This summer, Vons is providing more than 500 entry-level positions for these qualified applicants. Why? Because it works. And the size and service of your business doesn't matter. Whether you've got one job or 100, go to HireLAYouth.com. You'll save time and money on recruiting, and your candidates are pre-qualified. Check out HireLAYouth.com. Brought to you by the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce, Vaughn, Majestic Realty, the City of Los Angeles Community Development Department, Ralph's, and the City of Los Angeles Workforce Investment Board. Get qualified candidates between the ages of 16 and 24. Go to HireLAYouth.com. Good morning. Welcome back to the Free Your Mind Project radio show. I am Brian with my guest host, Wendy. Uh, This is the show where we break stigma, all kinds of stigma about all kinds of issues. Uh, We are, as we were saying at the break, um, talking about uh, Mental Health Awareness Month, which is the month of May. But we're also talking about Foster Care Awareness Month. And with us this morning is Ilya Haudegui from the Fostering Imagination Organization. Uh, Ilya, good morning. Welcome to the Free Your Mind Project's radio show. Good morning, Wendy and Brian. Good morning. Thank you for having us. Thanks for coming. I also brought uh, two of our uh, youth from Foster Imagination um, the participants, uh, Shamia Gray and Dante Brown, who are both uh, recently emancipated from the foster care system, and a child therapist uh, that we recently started working with with our organization, and her name is Jeanette Yof. Good morning, everyone. Hi. Welcome, all of you, to the show. Thanks for spending your Sunday morning with us and most of Southern California. Let's start with um, a little bit about why you started the organization. Well, the idea came um, to me when I was in law school. Uh, It was my last year of law school, and I was taking a children in the law class and was uh, interning at the Children's Law Center, which are the attorneys that represent youth in foster care. And I had the opportunity to get to know some of the children that went through the foster care system and started learning about the tragic uh, statistics uh, about youth um, that went through the foster care system. And I felt the need to get involved and start programs that would help these youth overcome those challenges, such as um, self-esteem, grades dropping, uh, and just losing a sense of themselves and stability as they entered the foster care system. Uh, So I kind of figure out the passions that I enjoyed doing, which were outdoors, adventure things, hiking and biking, kayaking, and theater. 
Um, my uh, my hu- husband now, um, he was a great inspiration to me as well, and and uh, he helped me uh, get a program together. He is a co-founder for the Ruskin Group Theater uh, in Santa Monica, and they opened their doors for us to start a theater program out of there. Uh, after that, they also opened uh, other facilities to, uh, for us to open a computer center. So we started life skills courses and theater courses and um, bring the kids out for different kinds of adventures. And it really... You could see the fact that it takes up uh, on kids when they enter the program. It's just tremendous. This is wonderful. This I'm, is I, really I hope wonderful. I don't cry because I, <laughs> I always start, start crying when I talk about crying. my kids. <laughs> just for our listeners, I'll let you know I do see tears. But <laughs> <laughs> she's getting a pat on the back from uh, her you know, kids over here, so that's good. I have tissue for you. <laughs> so, um, uh, what are some of the, uh, if you could give us a general statistics of the challenges that the kids go through? I think a Jeanette, I think I'm going to pass this one to Jeanette. She's a little uh, challenges that children go through who've been in foster care, uh, based on their life stories, their histories, they have been through so much abuse, neglect, mm. uh, they have may, may have um, experienced death of a parent. Um, they have lost their families. There has been multiple losses, not only losses of their families, but personal belongings, mm. uh, losses of environments, being in schools. The average child that goes through foster placement is an average of three to five placements in a child's lifespan oh of foster care. So think about that, having moving, moving from three to five homes under the age of 18 is just tremendous. and. Uh, the grief and loss that comes with that uh, is a very, it's very difficult for them to work through that grief and loss because they really need a significant attachment figure to process that loss with them. Someone that they can share the grief and loss with so that it, they can feel as if their life does have meaning. They can make sense of their lives through a narrative. And therapy is very important for them, as well as working through any early trauma and abuse that they have experienced in their y- youth. Um, you know, the first three years of life are the most important. And if a child has endured trauma in the first three years of life, that becomes their imprint. And a lot of the kids that are coming in, into foster care are under the age of three years old. Oh, God. And to have endured that loss is tremendous. And the, um, the work that I do is attachment-based, and it's attachment-based family therapy because it truly is the... Uh, therapy that works with this population. Doing traditional therapy does not work because you're separating the child from the caretaker. It's very important to have the parents involved, the foster parents involved in that child's grief and loss, helping them work through it and process it, and giving, giving them some meaning and a sense of worth that what has happened, yes, it has been painful, but you can work through it and manage that pain with someone else. And it's through a shared experience that is so important in relationship. Yeah, our programs uh, mainly focus on kids between the ages of 12 and 19. Uh, however, once they're part of our program, they're they're always going to be a part of our program. We have kids that are 20, 21, and older that come back and either to visit or participate in our um, activities or become mentors. Like um, many of the, the youth um, in our programs now are become uh, training to become mentors. That's right. uh, but we focus on this age group because once they hit. 12 years old in foster care, it, it, they, it's very unlikely that they will ever be adopted out of foster care. Oh. And so they don't have any stability. They don't have that family environment. They don't have anybody they can, they can really trust because they've shifted so many times between different social workers, between attorneys, between foster homes. And so our whole goal is to provide a stable environment for these kids. So at least one, one Saturday a week, one, one day a week, they can come and be a part of something that, that they feel like they can really be themselves and, and know that they're around caring people that really care, uh, you know, care about what's going on in their lives and what they're going to be doing in their future. It sounds like a great program, and actually we were going to get to uh, uh, a couple of the, the folks that you brought along. Let's take our listeners back, though, um, to, you, you had mentioned, Jeanette, the you know, sort of zero to three being the most important years. Um, can, can you sort of take us through how, how does the foster care system work? I mean, in other words, what is, you know, you, know, you see some of those signs. We, we saw uh, signs yesterday. There's a, like, safe haven if you 
want to give your child, I guess, over to the authorities. Can you, it's a very basic question, but I want everyone out there to understand exactly what it is that we're talking about and how the system works. So can you kind of give us through, you know, get, take us through uh, the, sort of the, I guess, zero to three child that gets entered into the system, but then also it sounds like it's completely different for uh, maybe some young folks who are a little bit older and go in, if you can just sort of broadly paint some broad strokes of how that works. Well, basically, uh, you know, the child abuse hotline could get called in an instance. And then a child is called through Department of Children and Family Services, a social worker, uh, an emergency social worker is sent to the home to investigate an abuse allegation of any kind. Maybe there's neglect, uh, someone hears a child screaming, hears them being hit. Um, social worker is sent to the home. They investigate, and then at that point, we'll determine whether the child will be retained at that point and then be placed in the foster care system for some time in order for the biological family to get some help uh, for whatever the allegation was at that time. Because mm -hmm. really, truly, Department of Children and Family Services wants family reunification. They want children to remain with their biological families, but that is not always possible right. because there is so much, so many issues. Uh, and parenting is very difficult. I'm a parent myself. It takes a lot of strength and endurance and responsibility. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of difficulty with um in taking responsibility, and I think there's a lot of kids in the system because parenting is a full-time job, and it takes a lot of responsibility. But um, so then uh, the child will be detained through DCFS, and then they are placed in a. Typically, if they don't have a home right away, it will be like a an emergency respite home for a couple weeks until they can find a stable home for that child, which is considered a foster home. If it's family reunif reunification, they're going to keep them in foster care. If they're, if they're noticing that the biological parents are not doing their case plan, which is what they're given when they go into the system, if they're not complying with it, you know, therapy, going to uh, drug, go doing drug testing, whatever the allegation was, if they're not pursuing their case plan, then their legal rights as parents can be terminated. And then the child under the age of three, they really want to push to have that stable environment, family environment, so they want to push foster adoption. Mm -hmm. However, when we're dealing with children who've had early trauma and abuse, they're going to act out. And this is the stigma that children act out mm -hmm. because they are stressed out and they truly are in pain. And I think the stigma that I want to wipe out <laughs> is that children act out not because they want attention. It is because they need attention. Right. And they need that significant parent attachment figure to see underneath the behavior what the need is because under the age of three need, needs need to be met and we're dealing with kids who have unmet needs and they're crying out for this attention because they do, did not get these needs met in their early three years of life which is so important in building trust creating autonomy feeling safe and secure in the world and if a child doesn't have that in place then they that's their blueprint they don't feel safe so they need a consistent, stable environment. And then off they go, either they become adopted or because there's something called, which I hate in the system, which is called a seven day notice. Is it the seven day notice or a yeah, 10 day notice? It's seven day. Seven day notice. Do you want to talk about that, Shamia? Has that ever happened to you? Seven day notice where you can be removed from the home within seven days from acting out. So if you're in a foster home, a foster placement, and it's not going well, then the parent at that point can say, okay, the foster parent, I can't handle this child, send them someplace else. Wow. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of need and support, not only for the kids, but for the parents. Foster parents need a lot of help and support in how do I help a child who's grieving, who is, who's had this early trauma? How can I be of support as opposed to re being reactive, which is the fear, I can't handle this child. But truly, if we can see the fear, see what's beneath the behavior, because it is scary. Mm -hmm. Scared kids will do scary things. And they're <laughs> frightened, these kids. You know, they've gone from two, three, four homes, and they're crying out, someone please understand why I'm acting out. It's not because I don't uh, love you. I don't care. I, I want that connection. I just don't know how mm. to get it. Isn't is there training? The oh, really? Is there yeah, training for the um, for the foster parents? Yes, there is. 
Yes, there is. <laughs> you don't feel they all yeah, have that, training? No, they I, have. I hear a yeah, but there. Yeah. yeah, a lot of them, you have to take foster parent classes to be able to become a foster parent, but sometimes I feel like you can't train somebody to be a parent. Oh, good really. point. <laughs> good point. And I think foster kids, and I'm a former foster child myself, I was, a, I was lucky to be adopted at the age of seven and a half, but I had my own early trauma separated from my birth mother when I was 15 months, which is a huge time and development. And what what's hard is understanding that these kids need so much empathy and compassion for their lives. They've been through so much. And I don't want to I don't want to place a negative stigma on foster parents because they're wonderful. I mean, mm-hmm. I know some parents that have foster parents that have taken in 36 kids over mm-hmm. a span of 10 years. It's just incredible. But the need is they need the resources, the support to have learn that empathy and have that compassion and see the behavior not as acting out, but a cry for help. Um, And there is an organization um, that is breaking the stigma because truly with this population, you can't do traditional parenting. Like a time out (laughs) is considered another abandonment. So doing time outs with children who've been in foster care is really a self-fulfilling prophecy for them. Oh, okay, well see, just tell me again Uh how I'm not good enough and not wanted. Or go in the corner. For or example, that yeah, or go to your room or stuff like that. You know, it's annoying. Dante, tell us um, uh, that's Dante speaking. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and uh, what you went through and how you feel that you you're obviously uh, well adjusted. So how you got through it all. OK, um, well, I started off young. I was like um Four, when I got into the foster business, I would call it. <laughs> um, at first, I didn't know my way around. Like, I, I noticed that I would act out well. Yeah, I would act out. And funny how I remember this as I grew up. I thought most people wouldn't really remember, but I would act out and, you know, I guess I didn't know the love that I've had because even though I've entered this foster care at such a young age, I guess it would be easy but I guess not and mainly I've really grown up because I didn't go through that many foster homes only been through with one and though there's drama in that foster business when I got older and older I started to live back with my aunt and her son um, me and him had drama as well mm-hmm. but I got through it as going to FI fosters imagination um, that was like my heaven back Aww. to the real world mm-hmm. for as I had to go through family drama and high school. So it was like I had two worlds on my shoulders, so it felt like. But thank God and thank everything else that I've gotten through it and just keep hoping and keep pushing, I, I guess. Good. Shamia, do you want to talk a little bit about what you uh, went through as well? Um, well... I actually went through way more foster homes than the average three to five. I actually entered foster care when I was born, and I had the chance Mm -hmm. to go back with my parents, but they had a severe drug problem. So then again, I re-entered when I was two. Um, Through my whole life, I was in 12 foster homes and two group homes. Wow. Um, I'm not going to lie, I was a bad kid. I was really bad, running away. Define bad, yeah. What is bad to you? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Acting out, running away. I was basically grown by the time I was (laughs) 10. I was was doing what I wanted to do, and I knew those wasn't my real parents. So it was basically like, you can't tell me nothing. And I knew that if I didn't like the foster home, oh, they'll just move me. I'll have another chance. (laughs) So, (laughs) yeah, basically what she was saying about, like, you're, you're searching for love or some companionship, that's very true. And you have foster parents who try to give it to you, but then again, you don't understand it because you've mm-hmm. had so many movements and so many people not caring to where when you get those good ones, you don't realize it. And then when you get the bad ones, it sets you back in your ways. Like, mm-hmm. okay, well, nobody wants me. So, yeah, I've had my good moments in foster care and my bad ones, but overall, I guess every foster kid is just looking for somebody to want them and to love them and understand them. And then on top of that, it's even worse for kids coming into the foster system at a teenage age because, truthfully, nobody wants a kid that's 
You know, everybody wants old, cute little babies and toddlers. That Nobody wants so an true. older kid. Mm -hmm. So when you enter the foster care as an older kid or you're in it as an older kid, you know nobody wants me because I'm not cute and all of that. So, yeah, it can. It was tough. Mm -hmm. it was really tough. And certain foster parents would also assume if you, oh, you're 15, she must, this must, there must be something wrong with her or something wrong with him. Is he violent? Cause um, I like you were like, saying, yeah. mm -hmm. so it's like they have labels D rated. Have you heard of that? Oh yeah, Jeanette? yeah. Yeah, exactly. I was um, considered a D rate kid. It's either if you was on medication before or you've had problems like acting out, talking back, and all that. They basically pay the foster parent a little more for you having to handle a bad kid. They have F rates too for well, if you have a severe. I condition. never heard that. Yeah, it's <laughs> just started. I just heard of like a few months back how if you have like. Um, a real bad like something going on with your brain or if you had like a really bad condition dealing with your body and you're in foster care you would be considered an F rate like I just heard about that yeah and, and those are rates based on a child's mental health and and medical needs so the parent will would be given more money to get the services and pay for services like occupational therapy or things that would not be covered typically through Medi-Cal because children who are placed in the foster care system receive Medi-Cal and Medi-Cal does not cover everything. Mm. And a lot of these kids need so much more like brain scans now based in attachment, understanding what early neglect had on the brain development and now what these children need. Um, you know, there's so, there's so much different treatment out there that Medi-Cal is not covering and right. not able to because it is, it is pricey. Mm. I just wanted to, to share a quote um, with you. Um, this is from a, a recent report by the Human Rights Watch called My So-Called Emancipation from Foster Care to Homelessness for California Youth. Uh, it was just released this month uh, and uh, kind of bringing together what Jeanette has said and Shamia's experiences. This is actually a quote um, Shamia gave them. Uh, so she began running away when she was 10. I'd, I'd go to a park and sit on a bench. It wasn't so much running away as it was leaving and seeing if anyone cared enough to come and find me. I just wanted someone to care. So, kind of. I care for <laughs> There's hugs going on here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, this, this show goes out to five counties. you got thousands of people that, that we give you a hug. You know, we're going we're gonna to come back in one, one minute. There's, you, you brought up something, Dante, that... Um, that uh, I, that I want to address, and I want to understand better, and let our listeners understand better, because this it really is a business, and these F ratings and D ratings and all stuff like that, and then judging the mental health. What's interesting is that we've talked about uh, ADD, ADHD, all these different conditions. So one of the things that I want to find out is wh what's this process? That because I mean you're labeling people for their life. I mean, literally, people can say, well, I don't want that. I mean, is it, and they shop for a, like a, through a catalog. We're going to get to it in a second. I'm going to get on my soapbox here. Uh, stay tuned. <laughs> uh -oh. uh, the Free Your Mind Projects radio show on air and online at freeyourmindprojects.com. We'll be right back. Free your mind. Are you in charge of hiring at your company? Now is a great time to hire LA's youth. Hire LA's youth has thousands of qualified pre-screened entry-level job candidates who have successfully completed the rigorous work readiness certification program from the city of Los Angeles and the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce. So you know you're getting a qualified candidate who uses Hire LA's youth, LaVons for one. This summer, Vons is providing more than 500 entry-level positions for these qualified applicants. Why? Because it works. And the size and service of your business doesn't matter. Whether you you've got one job or 100, go to HireLAYouth.com. You'll save time and money on recruiting, and your candidates are pre-qualified. Check out HireLAYouth.com. Brought to you by the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce, Vons, Majestic Realty, the City of Los Angeles Community Development Department, Ralph's, and the City of Los Angeles Workforce Investment Board. Get qualified candidates between the ages of 16 and 24. Go to HireLAYouth.com. Good morning. Welcome back to the Free Your Mind Project's radio show. We are uh, talking about foster care. Uh, you're on the right show. This is Mental Health Awareness Month, but also Foster Care Awareness Month. We've got a, a number of people in studio with us. Uh, Ilya Howdegi. Uh, has joined us with her whole posse is down here from, uh, from Los Angeles. Her, uh, her fostering imagination crew is rolling into Anaheim for the, uh, for, the, uh, for the Free Your Mind Projects radio show. Um, thanks again for joining us this morning. Um, if you uh, are just tuning in, we're talking about uh, foster care and uh, a lot of the issues that surround that. And again, trying to, as we do every week on this show, uh, break stigma. Um, we were talking about right before the break, the, the, and Dante, uh, one of our guests had mentioned earlier the, the business of uh, foster care. 
Um, mm-hmm. Let's let's talk a little bit about the system. And I know we were t- sort of talk, talking offline about a number of different uh, elements to this system. And you guys brought up right before we went to a break, um, you're given a grade level and you get a mental health assessment and, you know, you get a D rating or an F rating or whatever. H- how does this all work? I mean, what what is the what is the criteria um, and, and the breakdown for once you get into the system. Uh, ex- explain a little bit about how this whole thing works before someone like these. These two seem like great kids, and, and they're, uh, you know, uh, they're, and they're, they're labeled, I guess, and they go from one place to another. I just help put it in layman's terms so that our listeners can understand. Well, children coming into the system will get assessed. They will receive a psychological assessment to determine what their psychological needs are. They will receive a medical assessment to see if they have medical issues. Based on those assessments, they will be given rates. A D rate uh, is a certain amount of money higher than the regular rate of a child who doesn't have any mental health or medical issues that need to be addressed uh, you know, consistently on a monthly basis, having medical care, going to doctors. Um, so they're given a certain rate. Um, that rate is a little higher, like I said, than the average rate that a child will receive through DCFS. Um, so there's a there's one called a D rate, and then there's one that's called an F rate um, that Dante had uh, talked about. Um, and by rate, you mean actual what they're paid? Right, on a monthly basis. Okay, so these so already they have bounties on their head. <laughs> no, I mean in terms of like there, there's a price bounties. there's a price tag on their head, yeah. right? Yeah. So, you know, and people talk about it like they're like, yes, this is a D-rate child. This okay. is an F-rate child. Um, this is what you'll be having to do. You know, this is the commitment in fostering this child. Right. They and here's what you get paid. This medical issue. Right. And this is what you'll get paid. Okay. And if they can't, if they can't deal with it, oh, I don't want this child. He's just too much. He's just too much. Um, can I get another one? As if he were a toy or a radio or something like that. That's how I see it, pretty much. But yeah. Have you had that experience too? Um, yeah, that's why I went through so many foster homes because mm-hmm. people, I've had many seven days, truthfully. Mm-hmm. I've, yeah. A lot of people are just like, nah, I, I can't do it. So, yeah. And then I had some foster parents who actually kept me just because they were getting paid more for me than the other kids in their home. And mm-hmm. they would let me know that. Like, I'm only keeping you here because you're paying this bill. I'm going to be able to get that. You do have They some, said it to yeah. you like that? You have some oh, parents who will terrible. let you know why you're staying there. Especially if you're a bad kid. They feel like you can take what they're saying to you because of how you act or they remind you what they have to put up with and these seven day notices when you think think of yourself having a, a teenager how how many teenagers act out <laughs> right. you know the, right. they're, they're going to stay normal. out late try a cigarette whatever it is that, that's you know they stay out late they're, they're going to get a seven day notice and they're out of there instead of working with the child and teaching the child responsibilities uh, and they, they just you know hand them out a seven day notice and, oh. and they're gone and and a oh. lot of times um, there's no seven day notice that the child knows about they just you yeah. know a social worker will come and say pack to, up your bags you're leaving they wow. don't have there's to no notice at all yeah, sometimes they can come you can be coming oh, home from God. school and not know you had a seven day and you're like I just seen you last week oh well your foster parent put in a seven day and you're like okay wow like some they don't have to let you know oh, that you're so home. harsh well who yeah. monitors that I mean what that that seems so random you know you could wait up yawn and eh, send them back I mean is it that easy well you know what it comes down to it comes down to the parent truly feeling overwhelmed yeah not having the education or understanding of the mental health needs of a foster child and that is truly I think what the stigma is we parents don't have the education through the Department of Children and Family Services to truly understand why a child acts out and really being able to stay connected with that child when they are in that behavioral episode of temper tantruming acting out how do you maintain the connection through the relationship and there is a paradigm of parenting called Beyond Consequences and you can go to their website www.beyondconsequences.com and this parenting paradigm changes the old parenting paradigm and it really is parenting through love as opposed to parenting through fear because our own reactivity is when the foster parent says I see this behavior and I can't handle it and I'm acting now out of fear so I'm calling the social worker and saying I can't do this I'm giving my seven day notice right well now at that point is there an infrastructure and I I think I know the answer to this question but I'm not going to say anything is there an infrastructure through the state system or through local or maybe county system to sort of intervene and say well let's hang on a second let's let's kind of walk through I mean what's 
what's going on? I mean, is there a support mechanism there? That's a very good question. Uh, it really comes down to education. And if you are dealing, and I think this is something that Ilya wanted to bring up, when you uh, foster through DCFS, that's straight from the county, you have one social worker, and that social worker comes to your home once a month. Mm -hmm. I had a social worker like that. That's the support that you're given. Right, and they probably, and how many are in their caseload? That's what I would 40 to 50 yeah. on average. Uh -huh. Yeah. So how much can one social worker do in giving support, and maybe, maybe the child has a mental health you know, therapist on their caseload, maybe, um, and the parents don't have the support that they need to create that infrastructure, to maintain that relationship. That's where we need help. The yeah. pa foster parents need help. They need more education. When you're dealing with an FFA, which is a foster family agency, you can also um, adopt and foster a child through a foster family agency, which is usually subcontracted through DCFS. Okay? So um, you can, and when you go through an FFA, you actually receive more support because it's more community oriented, it's family oriented, they have a lot more training for parents, they have usually monthly meetings for parents, mm -hmm. they have groups for the children, so they really, FFAs are really about building community, teaching parents, giving them the support they need, and when you have, when you're with an FFA, the foster care social worker comes out three to four times a month, mm -hmm. so the parents are receiving that support that they need, so that when they are questioning, do I do a seven eight day notice, they have an FFA worker come, and they're able to come mm -hmm. home and do that work. But through the county, no, it's not set up that way. Yeah. So and then it just it seems like well, what kind of I mean, what are we talking about in terms of numbers of folks that are in the foster care system? And I'm guessing that it's just an overwhelming, you know, the the, the caseload between say Los Angeles, Orange, San Bernardino counties. Well, for for Los Angeles County, it's over thirty thousand. Youth in foster wow. care right now. Thirty thousand. Thirty two thousand one hundred and eighty two homes. Good lord. Oh, so and that's just LA County. So our listenership That's LA County. You know, you want to just LA County. So you we're talking about just in it, Southern California probably probably easily pushing six figures. Mm -hmm. Whoa. In the United States, it's, it's four hundred and ninety. Yeah. Yeah. And that's probably it sounds like low if it that you know, if you look at the other metros and how populations are growing in other areas. Yeah, or I'm just guessing. I don't yeah, know. and unfortunately, I believe that California has the highest number of foster youth in, in care. Oh. Yeah, how come we lead in all the bad areas and in a good area? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, no, California's a wonderful place once you get here. Yeah. yeah. Well, let me ask you this. The, the um, uh, you, you, you know, there's a park in, in, in uh, the Palisades where if you were blindfolded and they took the blindfold off you, and you opened your eyes, you'd swear you're in Beijing. All of the, the kids there, you know, are generally of a, a seems like they, there's a lot of adoption that comes from other countries. But um, wh why, if we've got so many kids that are in this system in varying ages, um, are people taking off to, you know, go back and forth to all these other countries to bring kids over here when we've got good kids here that, that really need a home? And would really appreciate the love. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I hear you. You know, I've questioned that too, and there's a few answers for that. I think Shamia brought it up, and she said, you know, there's a lot of older kids who wants to adopt an older child. I think one of the real core issues here is people, parents who can't have bi their own biological children, want babies. And typically in the DCFS system, there are kids of multiple ages. You're not going to get that baby, that newborn. And from other countries, you will get that newborn. That's the fantasy. I'll have a newborn from another country. I'll have a younger child under the age of three. Also, unfortunately, I think, I think, and I've talked to a lot of parents, I know a lot of parents who've adopted out of, out of the country, that they don't want the biological family involved. And it really actually cuts that off because when you adopt from Russia, you don't have the Russian parents coming here and trying to reclaim the child. Their parental rights have been terminated. So when the parent brings a child from Russia home, it's their baby. They don't have a, you know, to be afraid that the birth mother or birth father is going to show up and claim the child. Whereas in, DC, you know, in, in the county system, that's a possibility. And the parent can, you know, a foster parent can become truly attached to a child, want to adopt them. And then a biological parent shows up. They want their child back. They're doing their case plan. They get the child back. You know, I mean, there's been cases like that, or and it's you heartbreaking. Have the other parents <laughs> <laughs> who just stall for no reason. They don't want you back. They just don't want somebody else taking care of their child. But they're going to stall, so you won't get adopted. So that 
So oh, God. <laughs> so you're saying you're, like the birth parents, the biological parents, are fighting the system because they're angry or yeah. resentful. So they're going to stall the process through all the court hearings so that so a foster child never gets adopted. Mm. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, pretty much. Because I actually had a chance to get adopted, but then my mother wanted to come back in the picture and start doing this and doing that. And then when the parents was like, okay, you know what, never mind, then she disappeared off into her own little la-la land. So you do have those parents who just do it just because of their, foster, their child is in the foster care system, and it's the point of I just don't want them being adopted pretty much if you're adopted that's like less pain to me that's how i see it but since your mom didn't want you to be adopted does she know what what has caused you i actually didn't have a mother that was in the right mind so you never know what was driving her Uh like for real and then also hitting the point where she said a lot of people um, don't want to deal with the parents. That's why they deal out of state. Sometimes I feel like a lot of people don't adopt or want to foster older kids, too, because they already have certain morals from other people instilled in them. Mm. And you can't really raise that child how you want to because they've already been raised. And you have to deal with everything that comes along with that child's age. Oh, okay. So, Good point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But when I was growing up, I would visit my biological mom, and my foster mom was okay with it. But I remember one day, like, you know, I was on Crenshaw and Slauson, and my mom lived on Slauson. My mom moved to, you know, various places to L.A. Um, One day in the weekends, I come to see her, and then next weekend passes by, I come down there, and she's not there. Like, my mom just completely disappeared without a trace. Without a trace. Wow. Just moved away. Yeah. And comes to find out now, a few months ago, I just found out that my biological brother was on MySpace and I haven't seen him in a minute and then he disappears again. Wow. Oh my God. Yeah. So it's like things happen in the foster business. And sometimes I feel like they should keep better track of what your parents are doing too because both of my parents passed away but the sad part is my dad passed away when I was 14. I was in a foster home down the street from the hospital he passed um, he passed away in and they didn't even know. I found out through a family member where he passed away and how he passed away. And the foster care system was like, well, we didn't know where your dad was. Mm -hmm. It's like amazing how you have these children, but you have no idea what their parents are doing. But when they do come back in the picture, you have all these things for them to do to get their children back. So, yeah. I strongly agree with what you're coming from. I strongly agree. Because after what happened to me, I was just like, well, I was asking for my family. I was asking for my mom. I was asking for my brothers and my sisters oh, we don't know, we don't have a trace on them, or we don't have them run up on the, you know, the archives of foster care somewhat. Are you guys in touch at all with family members, other family members at this point? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I am, but my family is, yeah. (laughs) They're not people that, I love them, they're my family, they're my blood, but I truthfully can understand why the foster system just was like, hey, you need to stay in here until you're 18. Mm. I can understand why they did that to me, and I understand it now that I'm older. When I was younger, I really thought they were just a big, bad monster trying to keep me away from my family. But some kids don't need to be returned to their families because when Mm. you return, you notice, yeah, there's nothing for you to return to. You were saved in a way even though you went through a lot. Yeah, Yeah. truthfully. I think I would have... I needed the foster care system, even Mm. though I went through a lot. Mm -hmm. I needed them because I wouldn't have been better off with my family. Mm. (laughs) Speaking of which, um, how did you get involved? What was your first uh, experience when you went with Ilya and her group? Oh, yeah. Because that sounds like that was another (laughs) supportive thing. I had an attorney who, like, as I told you, I was really bad. So (laughs) my attorney was like, okay, well, look, because I was bad to the point where I was in a group home, and the group home didn't want me no more. So she was. (laughs) So then I got her. I was going to (laughs) say. So I guess my attorney, Patricia, I don't know how she found out about um, Ilya's group or whatever, but she was like, well, we're going to try this for you. She's starting off this group. She doesn't have any kids. She's trying to get some kids together. We're going to do this. So I went ahead and I did it. And it was better than being in the foster home that I was in, being with Ilya. And truthfully, it's been fun. And I can say Ilya has always been there because I hadn't been to Colorado and back. And Ilya went to Colorado to visit me and she didn't have to. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh. No, I have the tears. Yeah, no, I can cry. That is sweet. 
Ilya has always been there. And the sad part is out of all the people who've came and gone in my life, Ilya is the only one that's still standing there. That's so. a beautiful thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, it's not a sad thing, definitely. Don't it's look at me. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so she's become, you know, speaking to our therapist, the that mo- role model, the uh, that parent, basically for her, right? Mm-hmm. That that sticks with her, that is able to see beyond the behavior mm-hmm. and see that this is a child who needs who needs a relationship, a stable, a stable secure safe person in their life Mm -hmm. to to actually watch and monitor and see what they're doing you know having a witness to your life brings meaning Mm -hmm. and i've been knowing you for how long Julia? what four years yeah four years i've known her since i was 16 we're going on Mm -hmm. five because i'm about to be 21 Mm -hmm. so Oh wow! I've been for a while, and she goes through her things with me too. Small <laughs> peachy king, she has a lot to deal with. That's why Ilya is really. When you say you have a great soul, Ilya is like the kind of soul you can meet because she puts up with Aww. more than people can imagine. You're cold. <laughs> <laughs> she meant temperature. Yeah, she just yeah. touched her hand for you viewers, for you listeners. Yeah. <laughs> her heart is warm though. Yeah. 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 There you go. Sh- Shamia said something to me the other day, which. Uh, just kind of ripped at my heart and she said sometimes I wonder if if I went missing if anybody would notice and I told her you know I I would notice and I would you know walk the streets looking for you wherever I needed to Um, and this this touched home for me um, yesterday (laughs) because one of our um, emancipated youth his name's Gabriel, and uh, he uh, emancipated from the system last year and went into transitional housing in Lancaster. And I went to visit him in Lancaster, and it was pretty desolate out there. There was nothing for him to do. Um, there were no jobs available. He he was wasting his life, and he always uh, he was he's such a light. Um, and he was participating in our theater program, and he always wanted to be uh, he always wanted to get into culinary arts. And uh, so I said, well what are you doing let's let's pursue this and i uh we did some research together and found out that job corps uh, provided uh these training programs and one of the the programs they provided was culinary arts and so we got in touch with job corps and we got him into the san diego location i drove him down there about two weeks ago and he's been there for two weeks i i and why i'm bringing this up because last week i tried to get in touch with him and i sent him a card and it was returned this person is no not here no longer here and i called them yesterday and they said no this person doesn't exist they never enrolled i said well that's impossible i i brought them two weeks ago i i I dropped him off we went through orientation together and finally i I was able to find out that he used uh, or they used uh, a middle name that was on his social security Mm. card as a his last name so but at that time I hung up the phone and I just thought of what Shamia had told me and I was I was I felt like a parent I just I'm like I'm gonna drive down there I'm gonna start looking on the streets I didn't know if they drove a bus with him into Mexico and <laughs> I, 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 I was I was on the verge of tears and fortunately we were able to figure it out and he's doing fabulous down there so um Whatever I'm glad. Is. I'm glad that was a good ending. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, not no, so that scared me. Yeah, oh, I mean, the, uh, w- one of the main things uh, I know we're going to probably get into this about about what what you can do for foster youth mm-hmm. uh, is 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 be there for them. Um, be a mentor. Be a good mentor. You know, I know people. People's lives are so crazy, especially in Los Angeles. They they spend so much time doing so many different things, but they never stop and really focus on what's important in life. And and for me, it was really helping these kids that I have in the program and mentoring them and making sure that they have a chance to be successful in their lives because it doesn't take much. You know, it takes, you know, somebody to say, you know, you are special and you can make it. And for them to hear that, that's all they need to hear in order to make that change in their lives from, you know, wanting to, to commit suicide or ending up homeless or just, you know, ending up as a statistic. You, you know, just to be able to be with them and, and, you know, have lunch with them or give them a call on the phone or send them an email, just letting them know that somebody out there cares about them. So mentoring is, mentoring is 
a huge... Oh, no. So, you know a little <laughs> more than me. <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing you're right. But, but, so, but well, I'm sorry, uh, but I think this is a good point, though. Why, you know, you, you guys have both said it, uh, Dante and Shamia, both... Why not try... If you're going to be a parent, you, you're not buying a car. You know, you should be in it for the long haul. Mm-hmm. Um so isn't this a good idea, though? Can't you mentor for a while? And then you're like, you know, you and then learn. and then if you say, well, you know, this isn't me, that's fine. You you don't have to be a parent. But it seems like that would be a good way without having to put these kids through such. Yeah, know, can people join your organization and be a mentor? And just come in. They don't have to have the wonderful dancing talent. No, <laughs> no. We what's, what's great. We offer several different opportunities for our mentors. We've had mentors even be part of the theater program with no theater experience at yeah. all. Great. Um, and then we also have life term, uh, long term mentors uh, that are open to to the kids. It's always best to get involved with one of the programs to find out which kids you are good partnered with because sometimes I mean, you know my job is to trying to figure out okay this child is a certain way and this adult is a certain way I think they'd make a good match but I'm not always right um, however that doesn't mean that you're not a good mentor and, and that there's not a good mentor out there for the youth it's just not that partner so it's always good to get involved with some of the programs come out on some of our outings during the year and get to know the kids and see who is a good fit for you and from there um, you know we do do background checks to make sure everything is <laughs> oh good <laughs> I laugh at that though Ilya because it seems like I never had a mentor it's like I always shy back to you and Eddie so I don't like, was it hard mentor, matchmaking but I yeah. did but I always end up with you and Eddie like <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of a it's not a hard process mm-hmm. necessarily um, it's kind of you know committed well, and, and well, he's saying uh, matching the oh. mentor and youth, um, but it, it's just disappointing when it's not a good match. But uh, it's like, at least you tried. <laughs> it's like I did my best. Yeah, <laughs> most of the time, it is a good match. Well, tell us about some of the activities because I, I find this really good for kids and those of us who are still adult kids uh, to be able to have a space to play and be yourselves. Tell us about some of those sure. things. Sure. Um, well, with our theater program, it's it's a fostering creativity program. Uh, they start off in our introduction to theater course, and it's about 12 weeks long. They um, oh. meet on Saturdays um, from about 2 to 5. Uh, and we pick kids up. We meet on Saturdays because we pick kids up in our van from all over Los Angeles, from South Los Angeles to Compton to the San Fernando Valley. The FI uh, Mobile. Yes, the <laughs> FI Mobile. <laughs> and it's interesting because the kids really enjoy the ride just to get away, again, getting away from yeah. that life they live. They they have a camaraderie uh, in, in the van. They feel like a family and they, mm-hmm. they really get along. Um, and uh, but So we pick them up and, and run the program from uh, 2 to 5 and uh, they start uh, learning about theater through through different um, techniques of theater um, and different extra theater exercises. Uh, they do uh, Meisner technique, improv, uh, and then they're partnered with adult mentors. Uh, and they uh, we have professional writers come in and write them a short play. And they begin rehearsals. And at the end of the um, 12 weeks, they put on a performance in front of family and friends and whoever else gets invited. Uh, it's it's a an amazing performance. Our next one goes up on Sunday, June 13th. The public is invited at the Ruskin Group Theater. It's called FIU Take the Stage. And this uh, this season, uh, the theme is the, the magic of Hollywood. And I don't know if you guys want to say anything about your oh, well, experiences with that. Oh, well, Shamia, you want to go first or I'll go first? Go ahead, go ahead. Um, well, I've been in there for four years, as you guys know. Um, this will be five, like Shamia. <laughs> Uh, my first play was about trust and how, you know, I had a hard time with it was I would lie. And I forgot my other two plays, but um, my third play was um, Life Lessons. Where I was in a class, and we had a teacher, and I was like the class clown, and how I had insecurities like everyone else. And then we did a, um, a music video, which that was pretty fun. Well, with um, with that, once they complete the twelve week course, they are invited into our advanced um, program. And with the advanced program, they've put on live uh, um, uh, whole length plays. They've done music videos. They've recorded their own CD. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've done documentaries. They've made their own independent films. Uh, so oh. they get a, a lot of uh, different experiences once they they get into the advanced program. We did monologues too. That's right. That was fun. That's awesome. right. They were encouraged to write their own monologues. Um, some of them did and some of them took 
found monologues to do. Uh, and the other program that we started this year uh, is our life skills program, and we focus on really uh, – finding out what the child wants to do um, so we do a lot of career exploration and, and letting uh, finding out how much different careers make and and what they would need to do to achieve that career whether going to certain colleges or if not colleges what trade schools they, they needed to go to uh, and teaching about what to expect um, That's excellent. when they emancipate from the system tell us about emancipation and the issues with that Okay, emancipation is, uh, this is true, when uh, a youth in foster care turns 18 and uh, they are emancipated from the system and it's a court um, proceeding that they are required to do, the social worker and the attorney are required to do. Uh, in some cases, uh, that doesn't happen for one reason or another and some some youth have been emancipated uh, without a court proceeding and uh, Shamia uh, is one of those youth, and, and that's actually illegal for a social worker to do uh, and because the youth has to know where they're going. Part of the responsibility of the social worker is to make sure that the youth has some place to go because it was for many years uh, social workers would essentially drop a youth off at a shelter, pick them up from a group home and drop them off at a shelter and say, okay, well, you know, good luck. You know, you can probably stay here for about two weeks. And, oh, my and, God. So, so they've been trying to make improvements on that and started a transitional housing program, uh, and uh, and so the so <laughs> and social you're workers, laughing. yeah, social workers are <laughs> essentially supposed to make sure that this youth has a plan for their future, mm -hmm. has a transitional housing program to go into, or some type of housing or reunification with relatives that they can stay with, and some sort of plan for a job or school. Um, however. Um, unfortunately that doesn't always work out and um, due to budget cuts a lot of the transitional housing programs have been cut um, Shamia's transitional housing program they lost funding and are closing down uh -huh. and she was told by her social worker uh, that she needed to be out by June 1st and she's been having problems finding another transitional housing uh, program that uh, has openings. Because uh, due to bud cuts. <laughs> uh, so they really can't afford to take kids anymore. That's of my age, or that's over 18. But How old are you now? I'm 20. You, oh, that's right. You're going to be 21 soon. Mm -hmm. And so she's facing homelessness. So is that common, the homelessness issue for oh. the emancipated youth? Yes. yes. <laughs> um, yeah. About 40% of, of youth from foster care will be homeless within the first 18 months um, of emancipating from the system. About 38% are likely to be unemployed by the age of uh, at age 24, 25% will be incarcerated within the first two years. And when you think oh. about it, these kids who have no place to stay and have no job yeah, and have do? no support, yeah. you're going to turn to things that you unfortunately are going to you know your survival you know, I instincts. love that you have this the life skills you called it yeah. program that's that's one of the, the programs that great. we created out of the need mm -hmm. we saw with our youth yeah yeah Wow. One of the, I, I think that um, as we kind of wrap, there's so much to we we love to have you guys back on. This is really an uh, interesting topic. I did have a question though. In terms of, do you guys know? Um, in terms of the the budget, are there representatives who are fighting um, up in Sacramento and in Washington that our listeners can get in touch with and uh, and support this? And if not, we'll find out who it is and we'll talk about it next week. I know someone in the press, his name's Daniel Heimpel, and he has a website called Fostering Media Connections, and mm -hmm. he's advocating all over Sacramento right now okay. uh, in response to the budget cuts. He's um, he's a writer, I think. Uh, he's a news anchor, a writer, and um, he is very passionate about foster youth and really fighting and lobbying against these budget cuts. Mm -hmm. So you can go to his website, Fostering Media Connections, and he has a resource list of how you can get involved and, and advocate. There's also the Children's Advocacy Institute based out of, uh, I think, I believe it's San Diego, uh, UC San Diego, uh, and they uh, lobby for children's rights and foster youth rights. And we will so. put all these uh, links and more on our page for sure. And a quick plug for your husband, who we love, Eddie, who Eddie. is a wonderful, wonderful <laughs> web guy that we work with. Eddie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> at Business Smarts. Yes, there you go. 
Oh, yeah. Very important to say that, right? <laughs> yeah. No, really great guy. But we'll uh, definitely have all of this and more on the website so that people can look. And I just want to let everybody know tonight is our fabulous event from Foster Care to Fabulous. It's an evening of art. We have a wonderful art auction, um, um, live entertainment, live music, and a wonderful performer. He was a former foster youth, and he has done a one-man musical performance um, called From Foster Care to Fabulous. His name is Patrick Burns, and we're very excited to have him come perform his one-man show. Patrick. And we have, we also have um, Hal B. Klein and creator Sherry Hersey, um, she was also from Home Improvement, uh, coming out and they're going to introduce their new show, Lily's Light, which is a one hour live action family musical that's going to be premiering on PBS and it really shines a light on foster care issues in a very fun way if you can actually say that shining the light on foster care issues in a fun way but it is yeah, a really good. great show so yeah, good. we're really excited to see you out and where is that and where can people get the information yes it's going to be at the Ruskin Group Theater um, okay. uh, in Santa Monica and uh, you can find out more information on our website at fosteringimagination.org fosteringimagination.org and it's not too late they can still go tonight uh, absolutely right? yeah okay. Okay. I'll be and working there tonight so you know, <laughs> you meet Dante by, get buy the raffle tickets from Shimi and Dante meet yeah. them yeah. live That's there right. you go oh, I'll buy a raffle ticket I won't buy it <laughs> they really <Nice>. do exist <laughs> That's great stuff. And what time does that start? That starts at 7 p.m. Okay, so you, if you're uh, listening, no matter where you're listening, come on up to Los Angeles, or down to Los Angeles, wherever you're listening from, and uh, check it out. Listen, we want to thank all of you guys for joining us this morning. Jeanette, Ilya, Shamia, Dante, hey. my co-host, Wendy. One quick thing before we go. What's, what's the takeaway for the audience? What would you love to leave people with in regards to foster care? Hang that you there. can make a difference, I think, is what I'm hearing. Yeah. You really can make yeah. a difference. You can make a difference. Yeah. And just, it just it, takes a little time and mm -hmm. a little effort. <laughs> when it comes to foster care and things are you know, not looking up, it may not seem like it, but time is on your side. Yeah, and you guys are proof of that. So mm -hmm. uh, thanks again for all you guys that come in. All the information, again, is going to be at Free Your Mind Projects with an S, dot com, freemindprojects.com. Uh, thanks again to all our guests this Sunday. Janae, our wonderful uh, producer once again. Mm -hmm. Wendy, my co-host. Uh, this was a, um, a really interesting show. We'd love to have mm -hmm. you guys back. We want to talk about this some more. Uh, this is uh, Foster Care Awareness Month in November. We got another month coming up. What's it's that one? National Adoption, Adoption Month. National Adoption mm -hmm. Month. So here's here's your assignment. You got the homework assignment. If you're out there, you're considering uh, adoption. You're going to contact the people at fosteringimagination.org. You're going to get involved with their mentor program before you go flying around the world trying to find a child. And you're going to see if you're a good parent. <laughs> You're going to see if you're a good parent. And then in November, you're going to get busy adopting one of these great kids. Yeah. 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 Fosterimagination.org. Right. There you go. There you go. Wow. Thanks, everyone. Have a happy Sunday. Free Your Mind Projects radio show on air. Free Your Mind Projects with an S.com. We'll see you next week.